Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Altenity webinar to discuss ClickHouse on Kubernetes. My name is Robert Hodges, I'm CEO of Altenity, and on behalf of the uh, entire engineering team at Altenity, it's my uh, pleasure to share with you the work that we've been doing on Kubernetes. During this talk, we're going to be giving you an introduction to the Kubernetes ClickHouse operator, which as you'll see, allows you to set up ClickHouse uh, uh, data warehouses in a Kubernetes cluster. So with that, I'd like to uh, jump in. Um, but before I get into Altenity, I'd like to just discuss a few items that are uh, relevant if you are attending the webinar. It is possible to ask questions. There is a question panel. Please go ahead and type things in. We may be able to answer some of them as we go along. Uh, for, the other, for the remainder, uh, we'll get them at the end of the talk. This talk is not terribly long, so we should have plenty of time for questions. Uh, we will, actually, let me just pull up the Q&A. So I have the Q&A visible, and I also have uh, able assistance from a couple of the folks on our engineering team. Let me talk a little bit about Altenity. We are the um, premier provider of software and services for ClickHouse. We're a UK company, but we have a distributed team that crosses the US, Canada, and Europe. Um, we're the main uh, US, US and Europe sponsor of the ClickHouse community. Uh, I recently had the pleasure of going to one of our uh, the events that we helped set up, which was the ClickHouse meetup in Madrid which is a great event, and there will be many more like it. The next one uh, coming up is in Malta. Um, our corporate offerings include 24 by 7 support for ClickHouse deployments. We also have um, software, and that's what we're going to be focusing on today. The, um, one of the main things that we've been working on over the last quarter is Kubernetes support for ClickHouse, and you'll get a, uh, get a wealth of details on that subject during this talk. We also do POCs and training, so anything that's necessary to either help you evaluate whether ClickHouse is right for you or to uh, 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 to get started and, and um, train your team. So those are all things that we do. Uh, we'll come back to that at the very end and uh, recap a few of those services, but for now, we're going to dive in and look at the details of a uh, operating ClickHouse on Kubernetes. Just to level set, since um, of course many people on this uh, on this call are already very familiar with ClickHouse. In fact, if you're already a customer, welcome. Uh, so uh, I just want to give a very brief introduction for those people who may not know about ClickHouse. So ClickHouse is a very fast SQL data warehouse. So that means it talks SQL. Uh, the dialect is a little bit different from what you may be familiar with if you're an Oracle or MySQL or a um, Microsoft SQL Server user, but it is SQL. It runs on anything from bare metal to cloud, so anywhere basically that you can run a Linux operating system. It's very simple to install, especially on, on single instances. It, of course, becomes much more complicated if you run a real cluster, and, and in fact, that's one of the real subjects of, uh, of our talk today. Uh, like many uh, analytic, uh, databases, it stores data in columns with very high compression. So this means that a number of things. One is that any operation is either a sequential write or a sequential read on data. And because the data are compressed, uh, we read a relatively small amount of data since arrays, uh, this, this sort of column format tends to compress very well. And it also allows us, when we're processing data, to use SIMD instructions. So there's been a lot of work to optimize ClickHouse for speed by using single instruction on uh, multiple data instructions on the, on the Intel uh, processor. It scales to many petabytes. We know of people who run, have over, um, have 10 or 15 petabytes stored in, in, in the database. And yet at those, uh, even at very high, uh, uh, very high levels of data, you can still get sub-second results. It is open source, which is a um, big benefit for folks who are, who are looking for technology that they can feel comfortable with over time. Um, the license is Apache 2.0, so it's not encumbered by um, viral considerations the way GPL v3 is. And finally, as I've mentioned in passing, it's really fast. Uh, usually I split off to a slide that shows you just how fast, but 
today, uh, you'll have to take my word for it. It is very quick. You can have billion row uh, queries over a billion rows and still get sub-second results to, um, uh, to your questions. So that's the basic overview of ClickHouse. Let's just quickly talk about Kubernetes. And again, I think that most people on this call are quite familiar with Kubernetes, and that's why you're, why you're attending. But just in case anybody isn't, let's just do a quick overview of uh, what Kubernetes does. Some people like to say that Kubernetes is the new Linux. And what they mean by that is it's an operating system for, the, for cloud native applications. That's sort of nice when you're doing an interview on the radio, but really it's an open source platform that, that does a number of things. First of all, it allows you to manage container-based systems, particularly applications that are built out of containers like Docker containers. The second thing is allows you to build those applications declaratively. So you can basically load manifests that say what you'd like the application to look like. For example, the number of images that should be running, the storage that should be attached to them, so on and so forth, the connectivity, security, and Kubernetes will make it so. A third thing that it does is allows you to allocate machine resources very efficiently. So you build a, uh, you build a Kubernetes cluster, you allocate a certain number of either VMs or racked machines to it, and then you can load on a, as many applications as you like to try and utilize those machines as fully as possible. And being containers, of course, they can be distributed across any of the machines. And this allows you to have relatively granular resource uh, uh, resource management. And then a final thing about Kubernetes is it's very focused on automation. And as you'll see uh, in the examples, and of course, as you uh, know from your own experience, if you're a Kubernetes user, just about any operation in Kubernetes can either be turned into a script or a program so that it can be done completely automatically. So in summary, Kubernetes is a good thing. We really like Kubernetes. But one of the questions that you have to ask is, particularly when we're managing data, is why do we even want to run ClickHouse on Kubernetes? Traditionally, Kubernetes has been used for stateless applications. That's sort of how, uh, particularly how containers started. Um, but there's been a shift over the last few years. And at this point, there are a number of important reasons why you would choose to use Kubernetes. First one is all the other applications are already are there. We encounter many people, and this may be the case in, in your own um, IT practices, there are many enterprises that have decided that, enter, that, that Kubernetes will be the platform for applications going forward. So if you have analytic apps that are, for example, doing visualization or uh, uh, doing machine learning, they may already be running as, uh, as Kubernetes applications. So putting the data warehouse there is a natural move because it actually just puts it in the same place as the rest of the apps. The second thing is portability. And this is one of the big strengths of Kubernetes, that a, a basic Kubernetes application is by and large pretty much able to run on any Kubernetes cluster. There are, of course, some, uh, some variations in Kubernetes. We'll have a chance to touch on those. But generally speaking, if you build the container app, you build the manifest, and it runs, for example, on Amazon, you can flip around and um, run it on any other, any other modern, or, you know, sort of up-to-date Kubernetes distribution. Third thing is it allows you to bring data warehouses up uh, quickly. This is something that's hard to appreciate until you've really tried it. So uh, if you want to, hold on that one. The, I think the demos that we're going to show will, will show this quite clearly. Um, the final thing is it's much easier to manage than deployment on hosts. And where the management comes in is when you start to look at things like our resource levels, uh, managing storage, managing, uh, ensure that you have, ensuring that you have adequate compute, networking, things like that, over time, and particularly as things grow, Kubernetes is designed to manage that thing, as, that those types of resources as a block, um, rather than you having to run around and sort of worry about individual VMs or racked machines. So over time, we believe that this is a man, this is an easier way to manage um, many uh, many uh, data warehouse deployments. So these are all good reasons, uh, and we'll touch on uh, most of them as we go through the demo. Um, 
now it's time to dive in and uh, really start to look at what ClickHouse looks like on Kubernetes. A number of people have, uh, including folks on this call, probably already have some experience with setting up um, ClickHouse and Kubernetes. Here's what the setups look like that you get with the Kubernetes, with the ClickHouse operator. So the basic uh, sort of working element of a uh, of an application that runs in Kubernetes is the pod. That's the executing container. But in fact, Kubernetes consists of a lot of parts. And let's just look at them. So for each, uh, ClickHouse uh, has a data structure where it organizes uh, data into shards, and those shards have replicas. In a normal sort of, for example, on-prem installation, you would have a ClickHouse server or node, if you will, for each shard and each replica. In Kubernetes, we have a pod for each one, and we choose to define each of those shards and, or, and replicas as a stateful set. That is to say, it's some compute which also has some persistent storage. So the parts that you will normally see for to represent a single replica are the stateful set, the pod. There's going to be a per replica config map, which gives configuration that's mounted into the um, mounted into the file system of the pod, and then we have a persistent volume claim and a persistent volume. So that's actually your attached storage as well as your Kubernetes claim to um, uh, that allows you to connect it to the pod. So that process, those five things are then repeated for each of the replicas. So you've got about 20 resources uh, uh, just from the, from the replicas. Then you have a couple of global config maps. Um, One's a common config map that contains uh, shared information across all instances. Another one is a config map, which is the defines your users. And we'll actually play around with that one because that's a very useful config map. By changing that, we can control which users are, are available. So um, we'll go ahead and uh, continue the tour. We also, of course, have to have connectivity into these uh, services. So we put we have a load balancer service that you can connect to through DNS. In the example that I'll show you, it's actually uh, comes up on a public DNS uh, endpoint. So applications can connect to that from the outside. You also have services, headless services, that allow you to connect to specific replicas. So um, that's the basically all the parts of Kubernetes. And then finally, we have Zookeeper. If you're doing replication, as you probably know, you need to run Zookeeper in the background. That's used to uh, maintain state and keep track of, of uh, which parts need to be replicated uh, between, uh, uh, between ClickHouse nodes. So we'll also have Zookeeper. Uh, that can be set up any way you want, as long as it's accessible to ClickHouse. We won't talk too much about the internal structure of that uh, in this talk. So that's the ClickHouse um, on Kubernetes, and the basic lesson is, hey, there's a lot of parts here. So what the ClickHouse operator does is it takes that those 25 or so resources that we have in this uh, in this configuration, and we're now going to turn it into a single, easy-to-manage resource. And the idea is that you're going to have a YAML file which contains a manifest for what we call a ClickHouse installation. You load that to the ClickHouse operator, which is like um, just like ClickHouse itself. The open it's an open source uh, project on GitHub, uh, distributed as a Docker image. So that operator runs in the Cube system namespace, and what it'll do is it'll consume that uh, that manifest file, and it will spit out or uh, allocate appropriate uh, cluster resources in whatever namespace you're running. So the ClickHouse, base, ClickHouse basically reduces you from 25 down to just one thing to manage. And then what we can do is by making changes to that, the ClickHouse operator will make appropriate changes in the, in the uh, Kubernetes environment. So um, what I'd like to do is start with digging into actually how to get the, uh, uh, the operator installed as well as removed. So we have here... Um, one one of the things that you can do is when in fact when you're operating on on ClickHouse and playing around with examples, it's sometimes helpful just to go ahead and clone the project. We have a bunch of good sample files that that you can use to set things up quickly. And then installing the there's a file called ClickHouse Operator Install, and what we're going to do is call kubectl and apply that. And um, if we want to get rid of it, we'll just go ahead and delete it. 
And in fact, what I'd like to do is just jump in and show you how that works. So we'll go ahead and um, turn our slides down. And what I'm looking at here is I have a, um, an, a Minikube installation, which is just running locally. And uh, so let's go ahead and have a look at what, what lives out here so we can see we we look at our namespaces. We see the usual collection of namespaces. Um, let's go ahead and look at the cube uh, system namespace because that's where the operator is going to go. So we'll do a get all um, minus n cube system, and we'll just confirm that ClickHouse is not running there. So we don't see it as a deployment or replica set. We don't see any pods. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and grab that uh, that file and if you were starting it from scratch this is exactly how you would do it so let me get the get the command so we're actually going to pull the file straight off github so slightly complicated command we'll paste it in bang we've got the file so here's the file just very quickly it's a definition file you can look through it at your leisure but it basically tells kubernetes hey this is a this is an operator and it's going to have a certain api and that's what we see in the this sort of complex de definition down here and um it goes all the way down to the bottom and it um sets up some security um and it also sets up an endpoint for monitoring that prometheus can attach to so that's an important function of the operator it's something that I was actually hoping to get to in this talk, but there's so much stuff to cover in the basic operator that we'll uh, look at monitoring at a later time. So that's our file. Let's go ahead and apply that. So kubectl um, apply minus F. Let's go ahead and load that. Off we go. Okay, so the operator is loaded. Let's just have a look to see if it actually was installed. So we'll go ahead and load it. And in fact, it was already in the cache, so bang, it's up and running. It's about that quick to get the operator started. When you're tired of the operator, it's pretty simple to get rid of it. What you can do is just go ahead and instead of applying, you can just delete it using the same manifest file, and now it's gone. And if we go and look for resources belonging to ClickHouse, we will see that it's gone. There you go. So that's setting up the operator and uh, taking away very, very simple. And this is one of the things that's great about operators and, and um, is that they do make some of these management operations vastly simpler. Um, even the operator itself is relatively easy to set up. So that's the first demo. Let's go back and uh, begin looking further at how we actually set up a cluster. So what we're going to do is start with a single node cluster. And I wanted to say in advance that these examples that I'm going to use do not have persistent storage attached. We're going to talk about that um, in, in a couple of minutes. But what we're doing is setting up demo instances which don't have persistent storage attached to them, which means if they get rebooted or you kill a kill a pod or something like that, your storage will go away. This is fine for playing around in the same way that if when you perhaps when you first uh, started with ClickHouse, you just did a Docker pull, brought it up, and of course the same thing applies there when you're running on your laptop. If the container somehow disappears, you'll lose your storage. So um, the manifest that you the basic feature of the manifest that we want to focus on in this part is what's called clusters. And what this does is it defines a, it's going to define the layout of a demo installation. And in this case, what I'd like to draw your attention to is we have one shard, but the name of the, of the cluster layout is um, demo one. And uh, we're going to have one shard and we're going to have one replica. So what that will do is basically will pop up a single pod in Kubernetes. And um, that's pretty much the same thing as you would get if you did Docker run off your desktop. What we can do though is once we have that set up, we can actually begin playing around with it and scaling it up and down. And so what we can do with this simple 
um, installation is if we go ahead and alter the manifest file and um, change the shard counts to two, what will happen is the shard, another shard will just be added automatically by the operator. So we're going to do that in the demo. Before I um, get there, oh, okay, uh, actually, oops, I thought there was another slide. Uh, so we'll go ahead and dive into a demo, and we're actually going to set that up. It's pretty easy to do. So let's go over to, um, to our demo cluster. So I have a cluster that's running in Amazon. And uh, let's go ahead and make sure that we have a namespace to work with. So we'll do coop cuddle get ns. Look for our namespaces. We have a namespace called test. Let's just make sure there's nothing uh, running in that. Um, okay, no resources found. So there's nothing in the um, in the namespace. We'll be a little bit paranoid and just make sure that there's no uh, persistent volumes. So there's no resources allocated in this test uh, space. So what we're now going to do is we're going to go ahead and set up that simple one shard uh, manifest that, or apply that simple one shard manifest I showed you a minute ago and then we'll see um, what we get. So let's go ahead and apply that. So there it is applied. And let's go ahead and see what's going on in the cluster. So we're going to go ahead and just do a watch. And what we can see is even while I was talking, it had already started to bring it up. So we see that there's a, we see the load balancer service. We see the service that allows us, the headless service allows us direct access. We see that stateful set that I mentioned. And now we see the pod, which is uh, up and running. So that's our one shard cluster. It's now defined on Kubernetes. That's great. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and add a shard. So we're going to run that second manifest, which is just slightly edited and changes the number of shards. So what we'll do is go ahead and run that. Let's do our watch and see how things are going on in the cluster. And so just by running that manifest with the number of shards updated, we see that, the, that, the, that we now have two shards. They're up and running. And what's interesting about this is if you if you have run if you're familiar with management of of um, ClickHouse servers, we've actually gone and updated the first shard as well, so that it's it knows about the fact that there's a second shard and that there's actually um, a cluster. And we can prove this quite easily by doing a just jumping in and accessing this. So um, here's the pod name. Let's just go ahead and quickly exec in and look at it. And this is um, one of the things that you can do quite quite easily is if you're curious about what's going on inside the actual nodes, you can just go ahead and exec into them and have a look around. So we'll go to here we are inside the pod. We'll do a PS minus EF just to see what's running. And there's your ClickHouse server. And we can connect to it quite easily just by using a ClickHouse client. And at this point, we can now do a select star. We can look at the clusters um, that are, are known to this uh, instance. We do a select star from system.clusters. And there you go. You see the two instances are, are, are available. So that concludes this part of the demo. This is. Um, We've basically got two shards up. They don't have persistent storage attached, but we'll take care of that in a minute. What we'd like to do next is go ahead and, and talk about replication. So let's come back and uh, look at our slides. So um, replication, as, as I mentioned before, requires ZooKeeper. And when you're just testing things out, it's pretty easy to do a minimal ZooKeeper in a separate namespace. That's what we recommend doing. That's how we do it for testing. You can, of course, have a ZooKeeper in some other location. You could, uh, it could be shared. Um, you can use an external uh, ZooKeeper cluster if you're paranoid about, um, about performance. Um, but the commands that I show here uh, will set up ZooKeeper and, um, and, and 
and will be sufficient for for running it. I'm actually not going to do that because it should be already set up in the environment. What we're going to do is go ahead and focus on how we build replicas. So the the uh, what we need to do in that case is we now need to add some extra information to the configuration. We're going to add a zookeeper clause, and that's going to tell the operator where zookeeper is located. So in this case. I've just added one node. I have a, a single node zookeeper instance, and I'm also going to change the replicas count to two. And so when we do that, we then have, um, we then are going to be able to, uh, when we apply this, it will automatically create additional replicas. One thing I should add is that if you have a cluster and you add replicas, if you have non-replicated tables, they don't become magically replicated you actually have to go change the uh, uh, the tables um, manually to make that happen. However, in the latest release of the of the um, of the ClickHouse operator, if tables are defined using um, a replicated engine, they will actually replicate schema one, as you add more replicas. So, just something to watch out for. Um, you have to plan for replication at the schema level. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and just uh, demo that very quickly. So we'll come back to our example here. And um, we have that uh, a manifest file that has this information. So let's go ahead and apply that. So off it goes. And let's actually, these are kind of fun to watch. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to watch as things are, are running. And what you see first of all is the pods actually, the existing pods actually had to restart for this. So that's why you see them um, running. And um, now what we're going to see is we'll start to see additional stateful sets. Once that's done, we start to see additional stateful sets getting added. And those will represent our replicas. And we'll give them a minute or two um, to come up. Looks like we've got one of them. We'll wait till the last one gets here. Actually, it'll get there in just a second. So what I'm now going to do is I'd actually like to go in and and um, log into these, but I'm actually going to go through the Elastic Load Balancer. This is the ingress point that's automatically set up in this cluster. This cluster is managed by COPS, which actually I recommend as a, as a nice way to set up quick test clusters. Um, or production ones for that matter. And what we're going to do is, in this case, we're going to go from our um, our jump box and we're going to go straight into the into the cluster from outside. So we'll do click house client minus minus host and we'll put this big ELB name. And that should be, a, it takes a few minutes for these to bake, um, as, as you probably know if you deal with ingress uh, configuration. But now we should be able to jump in and we're talking to a click house uh, server version 18.16.1. Uh, so, oh, actually, excuse me, uh, the server is 19.5. That's the latest one. Um, our client is 18.16.1. So here we are talking to the server. And what I'd now like to do is just to demonstrate that we have replication set up. Let's go ahead and create a, um, a test table. In fact, actually, let's just double check that we've got our clusters set up, so system.clusters. Let's just make sure all the all the replicas show up. And there they are, demo one. So four demo one replicas. So we've got replicas. It's time to now make a nice distributed table. So let's make one. And we're going to just do a quick example here, taking advantage of the one the table, the pseudo table one. So what we're going to do is create a distributed table. Um, you, from system.1, and basically what this means is it's a table that we can query across replicas. It's it's a dummy and just um, returns dummy data. But let's just do a, a select from this distributed table. And what we see right here is two dummy data values come back. Great. So what that's what you're seeing is there's actually two shards in this cluster. You're seeing a part coming back from each one. What's more interesting is we can actually go ahead and um, and uh, see the host name. So we can select the host name from each one of these. 
And this gets a little more interesting. What you're seeing right there is the host name of the shard that actually returned this data. And what will happen if we wait long enough? Ah, there we go. You'll see if you repeat this cluster or this, this command, it will come periodically from different shards. So what we're seeing is the effect of distributing a query across uh, uh, multiple replicas. So that's about it for replication. That We've now set that up. It's working. There's one thing you may have noticed, which is that we have a, um, we actually had, a, you know, connected into this cluster and we had no password. Moreover, this is a public uh, DNS entry. So in theory, um, anybody who noticed it could weasel in and have a look at your data. That's something we'd like to fix. So let's go ahead and actually fix up the users. And um, I have a slide for this, but I'll just show you the YAML file directly. What we're going to do is go ahead and add an additional property to the configuration, and that's called users. And we can use that to actually define the users that are, are set for these clusters. And what I'm going to do is actually define a new user called demo, and I'm also going to change the password to secret. So that is, um, that's basically uh, going to put a little bit more security on this server. Let's go ahead and run that. So we have, uh, whoops. So we'll do a kubectl apply, minus F. So let's go ahead and set our users. And this isn't very exciting to watch. What we want to do, though, is we'll basically go out and wait a minute or two, and we'll go ahead and um, connect to this cluster. So for now, we can get in. But what will happen <clears throat> is if we wait a few minutes, we will um, find that we're not able to reach this cluster. Um, and we'll actually have to supply a password. Let's just give it a second here. OK. It's, um, we'll come back to this and just prove that it's uh, propagated through. Changes like this take a, a couple minutes to propagate through and have ClickHouse notice them. So you'll need to uh, wait a little bit. But rather than delay the presentation, I'm just going to go ahead and jump ahead to the next topic. So um, we talked about users. And uh, what we'd now like to do is go ahead and um, uh, talk about storage. So this, in the examples that we've done so far, the storage has been non-persistent. So if you, you know, delete the pod, if the pod restarts because of an upgrade, what is going to happen is that the storage will just disappear. That's not good. So what we really want is to actually um, create a volume claim, which will then cause a um, storage to be allocated inside Kubernetes. The way that you do that in the operator is through something we call a volume claim template. So basically what this does is we have a, under defaults, we have this deployment clause, and we're going to um, add something called the a specification for a volume claim template. And this one is a template which will ask for two gigabytes of default storage. We'll talk about classes in just a second. And then it's actually kind of important um, in the current uh, st uh, stage of the operator, uh, this metadata use persistent, um, the, the name, uh, use default name, you just put in that value, and that'll ensure the storage gets mounted correctly. So uh, this is basically something that you then include in the manifest, and when the, um, when the, when the pod is created or when the when the the application is brought up, what it will actually do is prove the or, or allocate storage for you. There's another thing that we can do. Oh, actually, we should talk about storage classes because um, storage is a little bit complicated in um, um, in Kubernetes. We will um, actually have quite a bit more documentation on this as well as uh, cover it in later webinars. But just in general, when you go to Kubernetes, you have what are called storage classes, which you can um, which you can find out about using um, the describe storage class command. Um, generally speaking, there's different settings that you can have for the storage class name. You can leave it out or you can set it to default. And then what you're going to do is get whatever provider and class of storage you're you're 
Kubernetes operator or administrator has given you. You could define, you could bind to a specific type. So in my cluster, I have a couple types. One's called GP2, one's called default. A final thing you can do is you can actually disable dynamic provisioning fully and use static um, uh, uh, persistent volumes. And in that case, you just uh, put a couple of ticks and take the storage class name away. We're going to use dynamic provisioning for this because it's it's easiest. Uh, but in future webinars, we'll return uh, to this topic of storage and and uh, and describe the the management in much more detail. Let's talk about one final thing, which is in addition to having the um, the storage defined, it would be really nice if we could define what version of ClickHouse we're using and then be able to do upgrades. Since the storage persists, it should remain across an upgrade. So the way that we do that is we add something called a pod template. A pod template allows us to now set the properties of the pod. There's a number of things that you can set, including the, you know, sort of the resources, like the amount of memory, number of um, uh, uh, CPU megahertz are allocated, so on and so forth. What we're going to do is just restrict ourselves to saying, hey, we want the 18.16.1 server. So uh, with that, we can just go show how this works. So let's go back to our demo. And just to finish things off, I'm going to go ahead and prove that I can't get into that, um, to that cluster which I had set up and set the users. If you recall, we made the user the password secret. So now to get in, I actually have to set a password. So there you go, it propagated through. Let's go ahead and wipe that out. So we'll go ahead and um, delete that and we're gonna go ahead and deploy our, uh, in, our installation with persistent storage. Okay, that wiped it out, should be gone. And let's go ahead and uh, set up the, the installation that we just showed in the slides. So we're gonna go say cube cut all apply minus F storage two. That's the one with both the version. Actually, let's edit that very briefly just to make sure the version is correct. There we go. Oh, good thing I checked. It was set to um, a future version, but we'd like to start with 18.16.1. So let's go ahead and apply that. Okay, so it's created, and let's go ahead and do a watch, keep an eye on what this is doing. So what we'll see is that, like the, as in the previous example, um, it's gonna take a few minutes for the uh, container to get created. In this case, we're actually going out and allocating a couple gigs of, of, of EBS uh, uh, storage on Amazon. So this will take a little bit longer to come up. Um, Actually, if you allocated a lot of storage, then it could conceivably take quite a while to um, to come up. So we'll give that a second or two. You'll notice again, we have a load balancer ingress created. Um, one thing I should, since we have a second, oh, it's running, we can go off and visit it. Let's go ahead and visit this and we'll just have a quick look at the storage. We can talk about connectivity in just a second. So, um, So we'll go ahead and exec into this using our favorite kubectl exec, and we'll just open up a bash um, prompt. So we're now inside the inside the image, and one of the things that we see, and this is a good thing to check when you're when you're actually testing these things out, is just double check that you've actually got mounted storage here. Here we see we had a, a claim for uh, for two gigs of storage. We got it. It's actually mounted under var live clickhouse. That's where our data is. So what's great about that is now we can go ahead and actually do things on this cluster. So let's go ahead and log in with ClickHouse client. We will go ahead and um, do a show databases. So this will just have a couple. Let's create a database, just something that puts some state on the, um, on the disk. Uh, database. So we'll create database foo. We'll just confirm that we've got it. That's good. So we've actually got some state here. Let's go ahead and upgrade this cluster, and that's going to require us to uh, to reset the pod. So and and I'll bring up a new one. So we'll go ahead and 
will just now put in a different image name in the uh, in the manifest, and we're going to go ahead and apply that manifest. So here we go. So let's go ahead and apply it, and we'll put a watch on it so that we can watch it. And this um, applied almost instantly because the uh, the pod uh, the, the Docker image was already in the um, in the cache. So uh, let's go ahead and connect to it again and um, have a look at the version. So just going back, let's recall that when we connected before, we were connected to version 18.16.1. Actually, here we go, 18.16.1, there you go, that's the server version. Now let's come down, we'll run ClickHouse Client. And there you go, 19.4.3. And since this is a database upgrade, everybody's paranoid about data. Did we lose any? Let's just have a quick look here. I sure certainly hope we didn't. There it is, database foo. So that's basically um, sort of now you have persistent storage. At this point, you can really go to town because you actually have a persistent volume that's attached to this. You can add more shards. You can add more replicas. They will now have storage that will live through these various management operations that you go through when you're running a real cluster. So, um, and I'll just, one final thing, let's just show the PVC that, so there's a, whoops, cube cuddle. We'll just show that we have a persistent volume claim. What am I doing wrong here? Um, oop, ah, get, sorry about that. A little bit too much work with databases. Um, so we can show the PVC, that was the thing that got created to get us the bound storage, and then, the, uh, the persistent volume underneath that it's um, that we're binding to is shown as a persistent volume record. That's about it for demos. So what I will do is now uh, come back to the slides and we can just kind of finish up. So um, we have um, we talked about how to put the how to define storage, how to also set the version. There are other things that you can do. You can go in and you can now go ahead with these um, with these pod templates. You can begin to set the specific resources uh, for the containers, um, make them larger, make them smaller. Again, if you need to scale things up, scale things down, sort of do vertical scaling, That's this is your tool to do that. Uh, but we'll leave that as an exercise for people testing it out. Um, just a little bit of a roundup on connectivity. You've seen in the demos how we can connect through different ways. We can exec in, of course, and we can talk directly to the local server. That's not how applications are going to do it typically. So internally from within uh, Kubernetes, you're going to use the service DNS name. So we recommend using the load balancer um, because that's going to get you access to all of the nodes. Um, so for example, in the first uh, in the first set of examples with replicas, uh, ClickHouse test or ClickHouse client minus host. If I give this host name within a Kubernetes within Kubernetes where I can see the DNS, um, that'll get me to it. I can also connect directly to specific hosts. Connecting from outside um, really depends on your Kubernetes cluster. You can use an ingress resource. Um, you can use a node port. We were using an ingress that gets set up automatically by COPS um, and the operator um, correctly. Um, does a configuration correctly so that we get a, an ELB, um, Elastic Load Balancer uh, DNS for it, and then you can connect that way. So that's um, something, again, connectivity is a little bit complicated on Kubernetes. We'll probably return that to that subject in a later webinar. But for now, if you're a Kubernetes expert, you will be able to figure it out for yourselves. So um, a little bit of uh, some final tips. Uh, that we'd like to go over. There's, as you've seen, the, the ClickHouse operator can do a lot of things. So it's uh, it's pretty capable, but I wanna emphasize it's in beta. So you will definitely, if you use it for long enough, you'll definitely see a few issues. Um, the uh, and, and the real message here is that though we do expect this to go production and um, it's, it's improving very rapidly, we expect to declare this ready for production use fairly soon, um, I would not recommend going production on this today, uh, perhaps in two months. Um, just a few things that you might run into uh, to give you a heads up. Um, 
the operator doesn't always, if you make an error in the manifest file, you can sometimes uh, get configurations that are very confusing. So for example, um, if you get the storage parameters wrong, sometimes it won't allocate the storage or won't, won't mount it correctly. Uh, so I do recommend just checking the configuration, making sure it appears things are mounted, making sure you have PVs. Those are uh, just standard checks that you can do. Um, error logging is somewhat limited, although in the latest version of the operator, I'm one version back, uh, but the latest version of the operator has improved logging so that you can actually see what the, what the operator itself is doing. Uh, connectivity is something we're continuing to work on. Um, one of the things that we would like to be able to support, for example, is to automatically set up HTTPS and, and um, NTLS connections for people who like to have, uh, you know, to want, want to have things um, uh, 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 correctly protected in flight. We'll also be doing work to uh, give you examples of how to set up ingress and node port configurations. Uh, one thing I will say, and this is a really wonderful thing about using the operator, is if you've ever wanted to just set up and play around with a bunch of different configurations in uh, in ClickHouse, this is the way to do it. And we set up the replicas using uh, best practices, set up you know macros and things like that, all these sort of internal things. The operator does this automatically. It's a great way to learn how, cluster, how uh, Kubernetes works, or excuse me, how ClickHouse works and try out different configurations. And so we would, at Altenity, we would love to encourage you to explore the operator, grab it, try it out, log issues on GitHub. In fact, issues on GitHub are the easiest way to communicate with us. Of course, if you're a customer, you can also go through support. So, uh, but, but definitely try it out and, and give us feedback. We'd love, to, we'd love to hear your experiences. Very briefly, um, roadmap for, uh, for what's going on with the operators, well, some other alternative projects. So um, a number of our, our, our priorities right now are to make the operator status um, easier to understand. So um, the, I mentioned the logging. Um, an important feature that is going to be going in in the not too distant future, uh, uh, not too distant um, future is, is default configuration templates. This will allow you to set defaults for the container sizes, version, storage, so that you can have relatively simple manifest files, kind of like what I showed in the first example, but they'll actually do the correct thing and allocate storage, for example. Um, ClickHouse health checks, another topic, give you um, simple ways to see how your cluster is doing. And then finally, um, put together and publish predefined Grafana monitoring dashboards. So not only will you have health checks, but you'll see it visually. So those are all things on the operator. Of course, we're, um, we're testing like mad, um, and any, any issues that, uh, that people bring up from outside will, will get immediate attention. And other projects, uh, two things that are coming soon that I'd like to just highlight. Uh, the Altenity Cluster Manager, this is a GUI interface as well as a um, API endpoint that allows you to manage clusters um, visually. And it will, these operations that I did on the command line, you will be able to do through the Altenity Cluster Manager. Our first release of it, which will be coming, will be um, putting this out for, uh, for beta during this quarter. This will allow you to see, uh, uh, it will be integrated with, with Kubernetes. And then finally, um, we're going to be, we're already starting to dig into some storage management. And the first thing we're starting with is backup and restore. As I think many people know, there isn't a really, um, there isn't a widely used backup restore uh, utility kind of equivalent to PG dump or PG restore. So we'll be working on that. And uh, stay posted. Um, if you want to find out more information, um, oops, we got a wrong title here. Um, Go ahead and check in with the ClickHouse uh, operator uh, GitHub project. So link is here, just uh, Google Altenity ClickHouse operator and you'll find it. There's lots of documentation, lots of samples. Um, you can also read the Altenity blog. We'll be publishing, uh, we have a, an article that introduces the, uh, the operator and there'll be more stuff to come. And then of course webinars like this. So with that, I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, I thank you for your patience. I hope this has been helpful. Uh, we would love to uh, hear your your questions and any, um, we have some of the engineers on 
uh, available so we can take the remaining 10 minutes and answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, great. We got some questions. A few questions for me. What's the topology of the um, um, of the deployment? Can you influence the layout of the topology? Um, I'd have to get a little bit. If you could qualify that question, um, do you mean, uh, for example, putting it in different namespaces? Do you mean uh, choosing the structure of persistent volumes? Uh, if you could qualify that a little bit, um, I definitely appreciate that. Um, how safe is ClickHouse Operator to use, your best guess? When do you expect to have first stable release? Um, my guess, and, and Alexander and, and Vlad, if you want to chime in, I'm going to say this quarter. So um, I think that in the current stage of the ClickHouse Operator, if you have a, you know, like a, a production systems, um, I would not, I would, test very carefully before you um, put anything out there using the current version of the operator, but it's improving very quickly. So uh, Alexander or um, Vlad, do you want to comment on that if you guys can get uh, unmuted? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you very much, Robert, for the webinar, and thank you uh, all attenders to, for, for listening to. Uh, that's perfectly correct. Uh, we, uh, we target to have production ready version actually by uh, end of May, uh, but it might take a little bit longer. Yeah, it, uh, Grafana monitoring, that's actually a pretty hot topic. Um, I don't want to be rash, but I'd like to say that you can come back in a month and we will have that stuff out. That's actually next on my topics for, um, uh, for um, webinars. And I'm also working on, um, we have some related work on the on the ClickHouse Grafana um, uh, uh, plugin, which we're now maintaining. So uh, give us a month. Uh, issues with using uh, persistent storage, or it is safe as mon mounting a volume into a container. Uh, Alexander, uh, do you want to comment on that one? It's. Um... We're still testing it, so we don't know if there are too many issues with that. Uh, it's, it looks to be okay, uh, but uh, when we just started to work with uh, Kubernetes, the first thing we heard that persistence is the most difficult challenge in Kubernetes, so we might miss uh, something, so we're still testing. Yeah, and, and if I can chip in, I, I share Alexander's, um, it, you know, the sort of not paranoia exactly, but storage and connectivity are two really difficult issues in, in Kubernetes. And the thing about storage is it varies. So one of the things I'll just give you an illustration of, we have not checked with a large number of, of Kubernetes installations. We're using COPS for testing. Uh, we use Minikube for development. Um, so it may be that, you know, like if you're running PKS or something like that, say from Pivotal, you you may have to do different things to make storage work correctly. We will be doing benchmarking. That is on our roadmap to um, to, to check performance of storage, um, as well as Kubernetes as a whole. So we'll have more to say on that topic. Um, let's see. Did you try it with Usernetes um, by any chance? Um, no, we have not. And uh, did you notice any network delays in running um, uh, ClickHouse over Kubernetes? Uh, for example, due to network drivers? The answer to that is no, but we haven't done the full benchmarks, which would allow us to uh, state definitively whether we see problems there or not. Um, my guess is that the, to the extent we do see problems, um, they are more likely actually to be with resources on the container. So for example, getting the, the number of th uh, hardware threads, number of megahertz allocated, that's, um, that's something that doing that correctly on Kubernetes can be a little tricky. We'll have guidance for that. Um, let's see, clarification, I might have a case where I want to deploy a specific set of machines, but then shard replicas and land on random recs. I'd like, well, I'd like. Um... Yes, uh, let, let me take yeah, this go one. Ahead. Uh, yeah, go for it. Uh, so uh, this is certainly, uh, we do support that. There are uh, rules for 
uh, affinity and anti-affinity, and uh, you can use labels and stuff uh, like everywhere in Kubernetes. So you pretty much uh, can set up uh, replicas uh, separated in different reps, and that was uh, one of uh, the requirements that we consider building an operator. Um, maximum persistent storage tested with Kubernetes, it's pretty small so far, sort of in the in the small gigabytes range. Our, our next step, and we'll be doing this over the next couple months, is to do some serious benchmarking on this. So stay tuned. Um, I, there, I do not know of any particular um, limits, but again, this is where um, storage management on Kubernetes, we, we will almost most assuredly find differences um, based on different types of storage providers. So, um, and so for example, one of the things that, that you always worry about with storage is if you have spinning disk, you wanna make sure that you're not sharing, um, necessarily sharing uh, across, uh, you know, sharing single spindles between a bunch of, of ClickHouse nodes. So those are, those are some of the issues that we expect to be able to provide guidance on. Um, did you schedule a move from Zookeeper to etcd? Um, it, there's work going on inside ClickHouse for that right now. Great question. We ask that that's something that we ask and are asked uh, uh, quite a bit about. Um, it is uh, Sasha or Alexander. Do you know of? Um, I don't think there's a date, an official date for moving fully to etcd at this point. Is that correct? <laughs> Uh, there is no date, uh, and it's a matter of priorities. Uh, so currently, inside ClickHouse, <clears throat> uh, the layer uh, there is a logical separation between the main code and the messaging that the zookeeper is used for. Uh, so it's possible to replace uh, the messaging uh, system pretty pretty easily, uh, but it hasn't been done yet, and. And nobody assigned to that, and so on and so on. So it's a matter of priorities. So there are a lot of things going on with ClickHouse now. Uh, so last I think we heard uh, from the guys uh, who are working on that that uh, they may have some capacity to uh, get to that by the end of this year. Yeah, and we do. One of the things I, I want to jump in and say here is also we do have. There's committers at at Altenity. We um, have a couple already. We're hiring more. Um, this is definitely something that that if you want to accelerate this work, uh, definitely come talk to us. Uh, we can help with that. The and I think the the etcd question, of course, is the first question that anybody using managing Kubernetes that's the first question they ask. It was probably my first question on this as well. So uh, we we want to move there for a couple reasons. I think we have time for one more question. If folks want to hang around. Um, almost at the top of the hour, but thanks again for attending. Um, love the questions, hope you'll try it out, and we very much look forward to your feedback. Okay, I don't see any other questions coming in. We're gonna go ahead and close the call. Thanks again, have a great day everybody. This will be available as a recording and, and uh, so if you missed it or you'd like to share it with your friends, uh, we'll be providing a link shortly. Thank you very much, have a great day.